Um, and so I'll talk more about how can BIM impact the process of how we create um, buildings and then, of course, entire neighborhoods and, and cities and, and use them. And uh, we have really seen uh, three main um, benefits. We can have a common vision. We can see what we want, what others want. We can align that and then we can optimize. And then I'll reflect on what we can do with now this capability um, in the long-term vision. So uh, this is basically the context from which I'm speaking, having had the pleasure of working with companies like these over the last uh, couple decades on uh, BIM. The key feature of BIM is that it is the first technology in the built environment, in the history of the built environment, that allows us to connect the social interfaces we must have so that we can tell stories, we can understand each other's perspectives, so that people can move the project forward with the engineering and management system uh, data that we must have um, so that we can simulate, we can analyze, we can uh, understand um, what a building or an entire neighborhood should be. Without BIM, you are, if you're lucky, entering each piece of information only twice, once so you can tell a story about it, and once in some engineering and management system. And this then becomes incredibly wasteful to keep synchronized as the project changes, as new stakeholders arrive, etc. cetera. Um, so this is really the big value that we have seen that BIM provides, is connects the social stories we tell with the analytical engineering managerial perspectives. And uh, we'll reflect on that, how that is important. Um, one of Ben's uh, colleagues a few years ago when we worked um, applying this method to the construction of Disney's California Adventure um, really summed it up very well. He had an epiphany after working with the BIM-based uh, process and he said, wow, this is amazing. The problems we find together, we solve together. This was an entirely new experience. Um, enabled by the common visualization that everybody could share. Um, before, he would go to meetings and come away with a big to-do list of problems to solve. But rarely did he actually have all of the uh, data or expertise um, to solve the problems. So projects would just drag on and drag on, and this is still happening in too many places today, actually. Um, and I suspect that uh, we can have the same impact in, at an urban scale, where we have to bring an incredible number of stakeholders together around a shared understanding of what situation do we have today and where do we want to go, um, and so that we can enable this engagement that really enables much, 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 much more faster problem solving. So we've seen three types of BIM um, that are being used. One is the visualization, um, which is basically what you see here. This is a snapshot from construction of Paradise Pier, for those of you that know Disney's California Adventure. Um, so that allows us to understand the situation much, much more rapidly. The second one, and you have heard lots of references to that already, is the information integration. And there the BIM and the GIS, the combination of really BIM and GIS, that's what uh, Jay has shown so nicely, really provides the framework to connect this information into then visualization. And the third, and I'll briefly illustrate those, is automation. <coughs> With automation, we can start to automatically create generate designs, we can automatically um, produce part of the design, um, and we can also optimize, which is where I want to look at. So the effect that we have seen in a nutshell um, is really summed up by this case of a hospital project that was built by uh, a company we work with quite a lot, uh, DPR, and many, many other participants. But you see through these snapshots um, ways in which people use these tools, the information and the visualization, in this case to create a hospital. The effect was that this was, to my knowledge, the first hospital in the United States, possibly the Western, the, the industrialized world, where the client got the entire scope, everything he wanted, for the money that he had set aside at the start of the project, so on budget, and 30% faster. 
And I think this by itself already would be a huge contribution if we could do this with every project, uh, not just a few flagship projects. So that's what we can achieve with the BIM-based practice. Um, we uh, put this uh, sort of a mashup together a few years ago. We also tried it on one of Chase projects to think about the triple E performance of an entire neighborhood. And uh, this is just a snapshot. This is a movie that plays over time um, that can that then displays, depending on the development strategy you're using, the, the, the buildings you de uh, develop, um, what is the impact in terms of electricity needed, water needed, um, um, various staffing needs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that we can start to understand the comprehensive impact of different uh, development strategies. So I think that's where I foresee that we will need to continue to use the visual tools because it will be quite a while until we have models that predict the performance of the built environment at the urban scale for all the performance aspects that we've heard about over the, the course of the couple of days. And so we need to rely on this mix of models and expertise, and we need to find a way, a focal point of bringing all of that together so that a project team, a neighborhood um, team can um, be on the same page and act um, together in, instead of a lot of friction that we see today in, in many of those um, attempts to develop our um, urban environments. So to highlight the potential for optimization, so if we can actually, um, and this is a development of a wind farm, because uh, if we have a BIM-based representation, now we have a representation the computer can understand and we can understand, and so the computer can vary the design and uh, can see which of these, this, which of designs perform better. And we can, um, so for a wind farm, we tried this um, in a couple of wind farms in Texas, and here you see uh, the wind farm as it was uh, designed and built based on the traditional heuristic that you place the towers where you maximize the wind income. Because that's the data the developer has and the designer. And so here we were able to bring the designer and the builder together and they trusted each other enough, they shared the data, which was the first time they had ever done that. And now we had construction da cost data and duration data and uh, wind income data. And now we could test this heuristic whether it is really the right thing to do to place the wind towers where there's maximum income. We found actually not so much. Um, we found that you, they could have built the wind farm um, with basically about 10% less land used uh, for essentially the same wind income and a reduced construction cost of 8%. Um, so, wouldn't be all that bad, right, if we can uh, save 8% of investment cost and 10% of land cost and basically get the same energy production. So, similar um, opportunities exist, I think, in, in many urban scales, and we're testing that together with uh, Mike, one of his PhD students, Rob, uh, Ben is helping us, um, looking at the supply and demand of electricity, heat, and water at the urban scale uh, to, to see what opportunities we have for optimization of that system across many uses. And uh, so that's a project that's going on right now where we're basically taking a BIM-based method to the urban scale. So the implications are that we need to start to think about how we get out of the purely project-focused way of working in our industry and learn more rapidly across the projects and make investments that afford the deployment of these kinds of uh, methods. Um, we need to not only value information and experience in the field, we need to also value experience, digital experience, and I think you've heard about that quite a bit today. And to enable optimization, optimization can only be as good as the data that you have. And uh, thinking back on Emma's talk, right, we need to predict the performance of our designs uh, very rapidly and comprehensively. And for that, we need access to data. And that only will happen when we have the partnerships where the, the parties um, really trust each other. So this is all we didn't reach today. Um, so where can it take us? Um, if, we, if you think about what a digital city um, requires, and, and I have to thank Bruce, who 
has been in and out, uh, Bruce Cahan, uh, for conversations on this topic. Um, we need to have the economic means to create and sustain this digital city, and or digital cities. And uh, to do so, we need accurate predictions of the performance of the cities across all the performance aspects that we care about. And Emma highlighted uh, key ones that we should care about. And unless we can create accurate predictions and then achieve um, that performance, the financing will be very expensive because it will be seen as too risky. So I see this uh, ability to bring expertise and data together, uh, model it, visualize it over time as absolutely essential to achieving our vision of a digital city.